this is Di and I want to talk today about my life with panic attacks. Recently one of my friend vloggers, a super fun Kate, she posted a heart to heart on her channel where she talked about a low level panic attack she had had recently and she really wanted to be open and talk about it because she knows that that would help people. That it helps with panic to know that you're not alone and she wanted to reach out and share what happened to her so that she could help other people which I thought was incredibly brave and really a good thing to do. So for her sake and for anyone else out there that has suffered with anxiety or panic or know someone who does, I wanted to talk a little bit about my life with panic attacks. If you've never had a panic attack, it might be hard to know what it is. Even if you've had one, you might not know that you're having a panic attack. A panic attack is when you have a sudden feeling of fear or anxiety and there doesn't seem to be a cause. It just comes on at once with no explanation. If I was walking through a fun house and somebody jumped out at me and I screamed, that makes sense. But if I'm driving to the store and suddenly I feel like screaming and hiding, that is a panic attack. It's a different thing because there doesn't seem to be an apparent cause. Part of that feeling of panic attack is a feeling of losing control. And so it's that feeling like, I'm gonna come unglued, I'm gonna come unhinged. I think that part of it, that feeling like I'm falling apart or I'm dying. Some people feel like they're actually dying. For me, I felt like I was going to throw up. I might think that there is a physical cause and that's the thing. The symptoms of a panic attack are things that logically would have a physical cause. My first attack was when I was about 30 years old. I was a stay at home mom and I was raising my son Caleb. My husband worked full time and I focused on the kiddo. And that should have been a peaceful time, but it wasn't for me because of my sudden unexplained symptoms. I would, like I said, feel like I was going to throw up. I would get hot, feel like hot flash or something, like, like I can't breathe and I'm hot. I would um, have tingling in my fingers. My fingers would start to go numb and tingling, like there was something wrong with my spine or my brain. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't feel my fingers. My heart would just be pounding and pounding and pounding for no reason. So I would get sudden abdominal cramps. And I think the most disturbing feeling for me was a feeling of detachment. It felt like I was no longer in the moment, that I was sort of floating above it. And so I thought something was seriously wrong. Now my first panic attack happened while my husband was camping and I was home for the weekend. I uh, got up in the morning and made myself a big pot of coffee and I started drinking it. And by the evening, I felt like I was dying. And I called 911 and they came out and they told me that it was a panic attack. And since I'd never had one, I had no idea. And I didn't know the part that caffeine plays in panic attacks, which is a huge role. I thought I needed to go to the emergency room. They didn't think I needed to go to the emergency room. They wanted me to take some big breaths and um, be okay, and it really did wear off. But that wasn't the last one. Excuse me, several months later, I went to a dentist appointment, and it was a dentist I'd never seen before, and it turned out that he had a thing about suction. He didn't like his assistant to suction while he was doing a cavity. And I got there, and I was, for an hour while he worked on my teeth, I was swallowing all the yuck, and that's when I started to have a panic attack, and I associated it with the dentist or doctors. To me, seeing a dentist or a doctor meant that I was gonna feel like I had to throw up. I had those tingling fing fingers and feeling. It was horrible. It was really, really bad. And I didn't see a dentist for two years because of it, because it scared me so bad. It, my world got smaller and smaller with panic attacks because as I associated the panic attacks with the dentist, then I associated it with the doctor. So I don't go to the doctor, I don't go to the dentist. And then one day I was at Costco with my son and we're walking through Costco and suddenly the panic attack started right in the middle of Costco. And the only thing I could do, think to do was I needed to sit down. So I walked to the front of Costco and sat down on the concrete. The concrete was so cold, it kind of woke me up. And I started feeling better. And then I took my son and we went and sat in the car and I was so upset and I was crying. And I called my best friend at the time and I talked to her on the phone for about a half an hour, 45 minutes until I calmed down. I was able to drive me and my son home. So then I started having panic attacks just leaving the house. It was hard for me to go anywhere. And those of you who have panic attacks know how this can be. They call it agoraphobia, but it wasn't really the wide open spaces I was afraid of. It was just, I was afraid of puking or losing control wherever I was. And so I just stopped going places. I 
quit being in the band at church because I didn't want to have an attack while I was on stage. I quit taking my son on field trips and stuff. I would call out. I would be anxious, hyperventilating, not be able to take him. My world got smaller and smaller and smaller till basically I was just stuck at home full time and I wasn't able to go out and do any of the things I loved. That was a really hard part of having panic attacks. Finally, I decided to get some help and I went through my insurance company and they sent me to Behavior Health and they had a nurse that was in charge of a group of people who had anxiety disorder. The sessions where I got to talk to the gal, which I think were like five sessions I got to talk to the nurse, those were a little more helpful, even though obviously it was a struggle to get there. She gave me medication, she gave me an antidepressant for me to take every day to relieve the panic attacks. And you know, it is depressing when your world's getting smaller and smaller. And so I started taking the medication, it had massive side effects, and I had a really hard time with the side effects, so I only made it a month. But that month was enough to break the cycle, right? So for a month, I wasn't having panic attacks, so I could go to the store. I could run errands, I could go places with my son and not have a panic attack. So I realized that those places were not necessarily unsafe for me. And so that was really helpful. I started buying self-help books. That was one thing that helped me. I bought some books, some of the books helped, some of them didn't. One of the books I had suggested that I embrace the panic attack, which is everything you don't want when you're having a panic attack. You want away from it. I want it to stop, make it stop, make it stop. And this was the opposite, this was saying, well, if I'm going to have a panic attack, I better have it now and just get it over with. And it's a funny thing. Anxiety depends on a person not wanting it. And thinking in my mind, oh, I want to have a panic attack now. I'm just going to have it right now would often make it stop. It's just the weird dichotomy that is life with anxiety and panic. And then, of course, my spirituality. I believe in Jesus and I try to follow him and this fear flies in the face of a lot of Bible verses that tell you not to be anxious and it was real condemning for me instead of encouraging. And so the thing that I learned that made the big difference was that this anxiety, this feeling that I am not safe in the world wasn't true. And it wasn't dependent on me being in the house or being in this store and not that store or whatever. The thing that really held true to me was that Jesus is my safety. God loves me. He's holding me. He hasn't forgotten about me. He's taking care of me. I will be okay anywhere I go. So I have my safety with me. It's not something I drop at the door when I walk outside. My safety is with me and it's in Christ. And so that was a big thing to accept that I was safe and that I wasn't alone. And so that really helped a lot. I started to get better. I struggled probably for about three years pretty intensely. And a story for another day is my husband and I adopted my son Regan. And to be an adoptive parent, you have to go to classes. So I couldn't stay inside the house. I could apply to be an adoptive parent from my house, but I had to go to meetings. And meetings were one of my big places. Like, I'm going to puke right in this meeting. That was the feeling I would have. I'd start, the room would start to spin. The carpet would come towards me, that kind of thing. And I think, I'm going to faint right here. But I didn't. I went to those meetings. And then we got Regan and he had special needs and he had a lot of appointments. He had appointments with the school, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the doctor, and he needed to be taken there. And I was his mother and I had to take him. I had to be strong for him. It wasn't okay for me to have a panic attack and my kid doesn't get his physical therapy or his IEP. And that, those things have to happen. And as I repeatedly exposed myself to all these situations, to people that I didn't know and going places, the panic attacks got fewer and fewer and further between. What caused my panic attacks? When I look back, I think about my age. At the time, I looked at the research and the average person onset with panic attacks at my age, at the age of 30. Now, I know there's lots of people who have them younger and lots of people who have them older. My dad died when I was a kid, and then my grandfather died. And at the time, I was running a childcare program twice a month for 98 kids, and it was the next day. My sister-in-law was really sweet. She came out and kept an eye on Caleb, but I still went and I still ran my childcare program. And that's something I should have called out. I think it made me very anxious because I tried to just barrel through. Also, when I was pregnant with Caleb, I threw up, and this is a whole story for another vlog, I threw up at least three times a day for the nine months. 
so all those places that I was afraid, oh my gosh, I'm gonna throw up here. I had thrown up those places. My body had that sense of memory. It totally remembered puking places. And so suddenly I felt like I was gonna puke places because my body knew that memory and it associated with the anxiety. That was part of it, the PTSD kind of part of that. I had been in this situation where I had puked all these places. It brought back those memories. One of the th pieces of research I had read, and I don't know about that research today, but they took some people and exposed them to caffeine and those people had panic attacks who never had them before. And what they found was that there was a whole other group of people that gave the caffeine and they would never have a panic attack and never had them in their lives. So there's a correlation between being sensitive to caffeine and panic attacks. And the people who are sensitive to caffeine can have them and the people who aren't never will. And I was one of those people obviously since my first panic attack was associated with caffeine. So my life now, I got where I could do more and more things. Now, I was tooling along pretty well um, after Regan, then came Gloria and foster kids, and I was getting through everything without panic attacks. I returned to the band at church, was able to serve, and had life free of panic. If you have a friend or loved one with anxiety, or you have it, if there's a way you can touch someone, I just felt the energy go out of me. So it's a way to transfer that energy and to not feel so wrapped up in that moment of panic and start to focus on something different. And so I had thought that my anxiety was really bad for white coat. I call it white coat anxiety, my fear of dentists and doctors. And I thought it was really bad, but I had seen an interview of a man who was dying from cancer. He was a guitar player in a famous band. And they said, how did your cancer get so bad? And he said, well, I knew I was sick, but I didn't go to the doctor because I'm afraid of them. And it's a fear that didn't pay off. So no matter how afraid I am of a doctor or a dentist, I try to remember that that's a fear that does not pay off. That's a fear that can take my life. And so I have to barrel through and go to my doctor's appointments. And if you've watched this vlog for any time, you know that I have dozens of appointments a year and I keep all of them because it's a fear that doesn't pay off. I haven't had an anxiety attack in a long time. I started to have one when I was at NIH last time because I had had a previous infusion that I had an allergic reaction to and they were trying to get an IV draw on me and it took a couple tries and I felt like I was gonna throw up or pass out. So I had a little bit of a low level anxiety attack there at the hospital, but I got over it. I got through the CAT scan, the MRI. MRIs used to be real bad really bad and I can go through them without any problem or medication. They're few and far between now. They don't own me. I've been able to go a long time. And I did therapy for a while. There were, was a rough time. Five years of my family, we had a really rough time. And I went to a therapist and I saw her and talked about my anxieties and things. So I didn't let my problems get bottled up. Sometimes I have feelings that take a long time to explain and I don't like to put that on my friends and family members. If I can pay somebody to listen to me, I like that better because I don't feel like I'm such a burden on them and that's their job is to listen to me. There have been hard times where I called my mom every single day and talked to her for an hour or two and that helps a lot. It really, really does. And so if you're out there, if this affects you or affects your family member and they're suffering with anxiety or panic, Ask them how they're doing and let them explain it to you, even if it takes a long time. Be patient and know that you are not alone. Families have gone through this. I mean, my family went through it with me, so it's hard on families, but remember that other people have gone through it and they've gotten better. Just remember that there's always hope. Don't give up, never give up, look for help, know you're safe, know that Jesus loves you very much and he's taking care of you. Even if something bad happens, you're not alone and you are safe. This is something that can get better. And so I am so grateful that Katie opened up this topic because it's something that I haven't really talked about in my vlogs. I have talked with other people who vlog and have anxiety. For me, having my camera or my phone in my hand really helps ground me and keeps my mind off the anxiety. And so if I'm going to a situation that I'm particularly nervous about, I'll carry my camera with me and try to film because that keeps me centered and focused. I can't detach from reality if I'm trying to capture it. Like I've got to get it on the memory card. So I can't detach. So it's a really helpful thing to be a vlogger. Editing is really, really good because I have to go back through what I was feeling over and over again until it doesn't upset me anymore. It's something that my friend in the Blair Vlog Project and I have talked about is how much editing helps 
regulate our emotions. And there's no, I don't think there's any research yet, but I would love to see the research that shows how vlogging affects pain and anxiety and emotions because I think it really, really helps. I just want to tell you there's hope. Don't be afraid, things get better, and this is completely treatable, and lots of people have gone before you just like I have. And now I have lived for many, many years almost anxiety-free. And I hop on airplanes, I stand in front of a thousand people and play bass. I can do all of these things that would have wrecked me before and I can do them with confidence. I go to dozens of doctor's appointments. I have the freedom to go wherever I want and do whatever I want to do where I couldn't with the anxiety. And just to know that it gets better. It can get so much better if you get help. I just wanna encourage you, don't give up, never give up. Thank you so much for watching. If this video helped you, please give it a thumbs up. That will give me that feedback. And if you've experienced anxiety or you have a family member with anxiety or panic, can you leave something in the comments? Because I would really like to answer your questions and comment on this so that I can um, help more people who have gone through it. Because what a waste of time if it doesn't ever help anybody. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you soon. God bless. Uh, well, what am I gonna film? So I start asking people, you know, Twizzlers or Red Flags. I know the answer. But anyway, start asking about this is a red line. So I'll link that one here. And um, and so then it spawned everybody else coming up with a lot of different questions. And so like um, Andrew asked people if they would um, be participating in National Kick of Ginger Day. And uh, my friend who was uh, adopting in foster care asked people you know, if adoption had touched their lives and to share it. And so a lot of people came up with these good questions. Um, Katie started asking people about Star Wars and Star Trek, which is really cool.